Y'all brought Bibles this morning? My text today is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Last week, I shared a message that I said would be the first of a few, and I, I called my message last week, your, your Words Matter. Your words matter, and they certainly do matter. Uh, we looked at quite a number of scriptures last week. We're going to look at more today. Uh, I've titled my message today, Have Tongue, Will Argue. <laughs> now, it, it's kind of a, a take on an old black and white show that came on television back in the 50s, the late 50s and the early 60s. If you uh, remember back in those days, there was an old show that starred Richard Boone in the role of Paladin. He was a gunslinger for hire. Have gun, will travel. That was his business card he handed out to everybody. Some of y'all remember that? Have gun, will travel. Well, there you go. What? It's back on. Have gun, will travel. I always thought that was a great a, 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 a great little business card. Well, how about this? Have tongue, we'll argue. You know, oh, we're always ready. Always ready. I got the tongue loaded. Just give me an object to, uh, to argue with. Well, my subtitle would be more uh, like uh, ignored verses in the Bible on the tongue. How about 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10? 1 Peter 3 and verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him or her refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. No guile, deceit, lies, deception. For he that will love life, we want to love life. Life can be good. We want to love life. For he that will love life and see good days. We don't want bad days, we want good days, right? Here's what the Bible says. Let him... Refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Today, I'm going to point us to a dozen or more verses in the Bible that deal with the subject of the tongue, getting the tongue under control. This meets us where we live. This is a very practical very practical for each and every one of us because we all have a tongue and uh, we all tend towards the misuse of it. It's a human tendency. So I know that you are probably innocent and you think this message really doesn't apply to me today. This is all for my spouse or for, for the guy next to me or behind me. It doesn't apply to me at all. Well, you know, we can't ignore what the Bible says without suffering the consequences. Um, it's, what's the difference if you're a, a heathen and you say you just don't believe the Bible, or if you claim to be a Christian and you choose to ignore the Bible? Not a whole lot of difference. Well, we're going to look at some verses today. I, I believe that these Verses on the tongue are some of the most ignored verses in the Bible. We see them, we read them, and then we ignore them. Uh, and I, I think you could probably also argue that just about everything in the Bible is ignored by, uh, by many people. Uh, the world, you know, they certainly ignore the Bible. They, they don't know anything about it. it what it contains or uh, what authority is behind it. Basically, the heathen know two verses. Two verses. One, God is love. And number two, judge not. That's the two verses they can quote. 
And with those two verses, they can justify any kind of sordid, depraved, perverse activity. And, and if you want to witness to them, they say, oh, no, that's your God. You're talking about holding people accountable or God's a God of uh, justice or God's a God of holiness. Oh, no. Oh, no. God is love. Judge not. And with those two verses, they approve of everything. And, and that's all the Bible they know, but to them that's enough. Uh, and while the Lord does say, judge not that you be not judged, let's remember who he was talking to. He was talking to the hypocrites uh, who were experts at finding faults in others and ignoring their own. Remember what he said, how can you, with a two-by-four in your eye, go around correcting others because they have a splinter in their eye? He said, first you take the beam out of your own eye. Get your right, yourself right with God first. Get your heart right with God first. Get your heart right with God first. Then when your heart's right, then you can talk to somebody else about the splinter that's in their eye. See, ignore your major faults while you zero in on other people's, people's minor faults. That's what the hypocrites did. And the Lord said, don't be like them. In fact, don't be like the hypocrites at all. Don't judge like they judge because, you know, their self-righteousness, they judged everybody as being beneath them. While they themselves were proud, arrogant, pompous, unloving, uncharitable, and yet they prayed. But you know what the Lord said? Don't pray like the hypocrites because they pray to be seen of men. They pray on the street corners. They want to, be a, they want to make a big show, a public show, so people will admire them. They don't pray to be heard in heaven. They pray to be seen of men. Don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't give like the hypocrites. The hypocrites give or they're going to give to the poor. But before they do, they want everybody to notice Everybody take note. I'm going to give to this blind man. This blind man on the corner, I'm going to give him a dollar. All you other heathen out there, I know you all ignore him. They sound a trumpet, you know. Don't give like the hypocrites. He even said don't fast like they fast. Uh, believers fast, but when a hypocrite fasted they messed all their hair up maybe spread a little dirt on their face went around oh i'm holy don't come close because i'm fasting i'm fasting but don't tell anybody so they do everything they do was a public display and so Don't be like them. But you know, any time somebody points out Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged, write down in your Bible or in your mind somewhere John 7, 24, because here's what the Lord said, judge righteous judgment. We have to judge righteous judgment. That is fair, honest, biblically, not hypocritically, right? Well... Just as the heathen ignore all the rest of the Bible, that's the only two sections of Scripture they can quote, I believe that it's easy for us to ignore the verses that the Bible, where the Bible bears upon what we say. It's too easy to ignore these verses, and it's too easy to apply it to everybody else, and it's too easy to justify our disobedience. So, since our words matter, uh, I would like for us to consider a number of verses today that do make, uh, that do have a lot to say about what we say. I told you our text, 1 Peter 3.10, He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips they, that they speak no guile. 
How about a prayer? There's some great prayers in the scriptures dealing with uh, our tongue. Psalms 19, for instance, and verse 14. Here's a, a, a prayer I think every one of us could profitably pray. Psalms 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We sing that sometimes. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. It's important that, you know, what we think about, that's important because what we think about, remember, talked about it last week, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in the well comes up in the bucket. Amen. So what you think about, what you ponder, it's going to eventually come out. How about this, this simple prayer, as the psalm says, O oh God, let what I say and let what I think on be good and acceptable in your eyes. Because the Bible says, as our, our text today, let him refrain his tongue from evil. You want to see good days? You want to love life? You want to have a good life? And here's how you do it. Refrain your tongue from evil. Refrain. The word means restrain it. Hold it back. That's what it really means. Hold it back. It's like a wild animal that wants to run loose. And we have to refrain or restrain our tongue. I was talking to somebody the other day about my dog, and they said, how do you walk a 200-pound dog? <laughs> and I so said, I walk him every day, every day, and, and he's, he's just almost 200 pounds. And when you talk about walking a 200-pound dog, let me tell you, that's a lot of animal to walk. But you, you, how do you walk a 200-pound dog? I said, well, you've got to have a good collar. <laughs> and so I use a pinch collar that goes around his, his neck. Not a choke chain, there's a difference, it's a pinch collar. But with that pinch collar, I can control him. And I'll tell you another key. You, you walk a big dog like that, you have to always be alert. You can't be asleep because any little thing, like a duck. And, and you know, I walk him out here where there's ducks all over the place. He would like to eat those ducks. So whenever a duck is around, I have to be aware and, and make sure I'm ready because if he just even nudges in that direction, I'll pull him and I'll, I'll tell him, don't even think about it. That, that, that's what, I, don't even think. And, and, and I'm in a stance, I'm ready to control the animal. Well, you know, it's not a whole lot different when you have to control your tongue. Whenever I get around people, I'm walking the dog, people are around, somebody riding a bike, I can't afford for a 200-pound dog to want to go play with him. Because if he jumps on you, he could hurt you. So I'm alert. I'm especially alert around people. Well, the same thing is true with the tongue, you know. Maybe we can figure out a way to put a little pinch collar around our tongue so... But at least be alert so that when you're around people, you're on guard. You're not going to say stupid stuff. Whether it could be just gossip, criticism, criticizing others, whatever it might be, you're on alert. You're always in a position to control that tongue. It's, I, I'll tell you what. It's harder to control than a 200-pound dog. It's harder to control. And yet the Bible calls us to do just that, to control that tongue. Here's what he says. Let him refrain his tongue. Let him restrain his tongue from evil. Boy, it wants to run. It wants to take off. It wants to bite somebody. That's what your tongue wants to do. In fact, that passage that we read as our text in 1 Peter 3.10, it's actually a direct quote from Psalms 34, verse 12 and 13, which says, What man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? 
Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. If we ask for a show of hands, who wants to have a good life? We'd all raise our hands. We say, oh, no, not me. No, who wants to see good days? Who wants a good life? Of course we'd raise our hands. Well, here's the recipe. Zip it up. Life can be good. Or it can be nightmarish. And it's not that people don't go through trials. We all do. Everybody goes through them. But it is possible to have a good life. It's good Here's what the Bible says. You want to have a good life, you want to have good days, then here's the recipe. Refrain, restrain, control your tongue. Get a grip on your mouth. Well, that don't apply to us, I know. It applies to other people. And keep your lips from speaking guile. Here's what one version says. You want to be happy? Stop saying cruel things and quit telling lies. <laughs> the scriptures, uh, another ver a version, the English revised. If you want to enjoy true life and have good days, then avoid saying anything hurtful and never let a lie come out of your mouth. That's pretty good. That's not the entire recipe because the next verses also go on and say, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Eschew, it means to, you avoid evil. You run from it. You, you hide from evil. But, but, but here's where the recipe begins. It begins with your mouth. You want to have a good life? Then get a hold of that tongue. It's not the only ingredient for a good life, but it's, it's vital in the recipe, and if you leave this ingredient out, the whole recipe flops. Y'all awake? Amen. This is where we live, beloved. And that's why I said we're going to take a few weeks and we're going to deal with this subject of the tongue because too many Christians just have no control over what comes out of their mouth. And, you know, it really can spoil your testimony and create friction in your home or, or keep the friction going. Instead of diffusing things, it, it keeps it going. And if you choose, instead of uh, listening to what the Bible has to say, like, you know, we're Americans. We have First Amendment rights. That's the right, you know, the freedom of speech. I can say what I want. I can say whatever is in my mind. Well, I have this piece of advice for you. Prepare for trouble. Because we're not supposed to just give vent to everything that comes to our mind. I just say what's on my mind. Not a wise way to live. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keepeth his tongue, whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue, keeps his soul from troubles. Amen, Brother Rusty. Amen. Whoso keeps his mouth and his tongue, keeps his soul from troubles. I was reading this the other day and I was thinking, somebody ought to, ought to maybe send a little note to the president and say, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tweets keeps his soul from troubles. <laughs> I think he could save himself a lot of grief, but that's another story. But, but uh, watching what you say can save you a lot of trouble. How much trouble, how much strife could we avoid if we would just shut up? Proverbs 15 and verse 28. Look, I know we get provoked. I know things happen. You get maybe criticized. Maybe the criticism is unjust. Maybe somebody says something offensive to you. Uh, the tendency is to reply in kind, you know, give them back what they gave out to you. But here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 15, 28. 
the heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The heart of the righteous is a great passage, another one of those ignored passages of the Bible, but the heart of the righteous studieth to answer. What do you think that means? He thinks about it. She thinks about it. Before she opens her mouth, she thinks about it. They study to answer. Whereas some are just quick on the trigger, shoot first, ask questions later. Better to think about it before you respond or before you shoot off at the mouth. Here's how one version says, The heart of the upright gives thought to his answer, but the mouth of the evildoer comes uh, from the mouth of the evildoer comes a stream of evil things. A righteous heart thinks before speaking, but a wicked mouth blurts out evil things. Think about those words, beloved. Before we speak, before we answer, somebody asks you a question, you know it's a dig. You know, you know it's, it's, they're poking you. You know that you can give them a sharp answer, but it's a soft answer that turns away wrath. Here's another good prayer. Psalms 141 and verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Help me to guard my tongue. Isn't that a good prayer? Amen. Help me, Lord, to control this mouth that I don't say hurtful things. You know, it's, again, I would mention it's like the bullet in a gun. Once you pull the trigger, you can't retract it. You can't take it back. You can't unshoot it. And once you say those piercing, harsh, cruel, bitter, angry words, you can't unsay them. You can tell somebody, I'm sorry I shot you, but you've done the damage. Think before we speak. Come on, Christians. We're supposed to have our spirit under our control. We're supposed to be putting this body, this flesh under Holy Spirit control. We're supposed to be men and women who live by the principle of the cross in our life, being crucified. So when flesh gets hurt, when flesh gets, wants to rise up in anger, think about it. Put it to the cross. Let that self die. And then when you speak, not rashly, not harshly, not cruelly, not bitterly, not critically, Gently, kindly, patiently, graciously. Amen, Brother Russell. Pray. Amen. You know, sometimes also, one of the things we see in the newspaper or hear on the news pretty often is how somebody got shot and killed and they were just, they were just an innocent bystander. They, they were... Here's two evil people shooting at each other, and they kill somebody who's not even involved in the argument. Let's consider this. Suppose you let yourself get in the flesh, and you get into a real shootout with somebody else, whoever it may be. It may be you and your spouse. It may be you and your brother or sister, or you and a whatever, another just a heathen, a neighbor, whatever. Let's say you get in a verbal shootout. They poke you, they provoke you, and boy, you right back at them. And there's the two of you. And y'all are going at it. You think it's possible there could be collateral damage? Do you think it's possible there could be other people who hear you and see you and think, my goodness, I, I really thought they were a Christian. That, that person is really saying some horrible things, terrible things. Do you think you can, that other people can be injured, wounded, turned away from Christ even? 
You can injure others who are innocent bystanders with your words. You can do that to your own children. You and your husband fighting, arguing, going back and forth. You think the kids aren't injured by it? You better believe it, they are. Come on, y'all. Set a watch, O God, before my mouth and keep the door of my lips. It's better to just say nothing at all than to say something and then regret what you said. I even think it's better to regret not saying something. Because sometimes, I, there's been times when I think, you know, I should have said something. But usually, <laughs> more frequently, I think, you know, I should have kept my big mouth shut. That's what I should have done, but praise God. How about uh, Psalms 39? Here's another very great verse, a Psalm of David. Psalms 39, verse 1. Here's what David said. I said... I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. <coughs> Excuse me. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Psalm 39.1. I said, I said. Who did he say it to? He said it to himself. He's talking to himself. I said, Rusty, shut up. I said, I will take heed to my ways. I've got to change some things in my life. I've got to change my attitude here. I've got to change some of the, the way I respond to provocation. I'm going to take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. This shows some resolve on his part, some determination on his part, that I sin not with my tongue. Spurgeon, the old English preacher, said, Tongue sins are great sins. Like sparks of fire, ill words spread and do great damage. And you know, we can say things like, like I mentioned just a minute ago, we can do collateral damage. We don't, just, we don't just damage the one we speak directly to. We damage the people around us who hear us. He says that I sin not with my tongue. Psalm 39.1, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. The New King James translates it this way. Lest I sin with my tongue, I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. Muzzle my mouth, Lord. Muzzle my mouth. And this sentence here, while the wicked are before me, the idea is that we should always guard our tongues and our mouths, always, always. But there are times when we have to be especially careful. I mean, really on our guard. Because maybe there are things you are passionate about. You may be passionate about politics. You may be passionate about something else. And somebody says the wrong thing. You know, it goes against your thoughts or feelings on the subject, and you are ready to express your opinion. You know, here's an important thing to know. You don't have to. And you are probably better off not joining in that conversation. If it's something to do with spiritual things, religious things, then you can join that conversation carefully. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom. Join that conversation with, with carefulness. But here's what he says. I'm going to keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. There are times when you just need to know to shut up. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's a time for everything under the sun. There's a time to speak 
and a time to be silent. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 7. A time to keep silence. We need to know the difference. Lord, help me to know when to just keep silent and not say a single thing, not to join in the conversation. You can be around a group of people and they're all criticizing somebody. You know, it's really easy to just join in. Add your two cents. But you, you need to keep in mind also that sometimes that two cents you contributed is going to be used against you. The time is going to come when your critical words and the things you said will be used against you as a Christian. David said, I'll keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. He had plenty of occasions in his life when they had people who were looking to catch him at his words. You might remember that David was a mighty young warrior when Saul was king. And Saul was very jealous of David. And Saul was looking for a good excuse to kill him. Even though David was the hero of the nation, Saul was jealous of his popularity. Saul was jealous that David would become the next king. He was already being eclipsed by this young warrior in popularity around the nation. So all King Saul needed was a single excuse to have David executed. In fact, he didn't even need an excuse. He made up stuff. But unwise words, critical words against the king, if he had uttered a single critical word, that would have gotten back to the king and he could have justified it to the entire nation. This is why we're executing David because he was a traitor. And you know what the people would have to say? Well, if he said that, well, obviously he was a traitor. He joined in on criticizing the king. So, look, there may be times you feel like complaining. It doesn't do any good. How about instead you make something a matter of prayer and take it to the Lord? Hello. Amen. And if you think that you can, you know, like I'm thinking about King David. Before he was king, had he criticized King Saul? There's an interesting verse over in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 20. It says, curse not the king. Don't curse the king, not even in your thought. And the Bible says, and don't curse the rich man in your bedchamber, not even in your own bedroom. Because here's what the Bible says. A bird of the air will carry the voice, and that which hath wings will tell the matter. A little bird. You know that expression we use? It comes right from the Bible. You're a little bird. Where did you hear that? A little bird told me. A little bird. Well, it comes right out of Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 20. It says, don't even curse the king in secret. And look, that applies to everybody, not just the king. We're talking about don't be ugly, don't be evil with your mouth towards anyone even if, well, it's just you and me, and you're not going to tell anybody, right? Oh, no. no. But a little bird might. Tweet, tweet. <laughs> yeah. And when we speak, beloved, when we do speak, even if it's somebody who has rubbed us the wrong way, although I know nobody here, that, that ever experiences that because we have our flesh so crucified at this point that nobody, I mean, they can rub us any kind of way. It don't aggravate us no more. <laughs> like even, even that person who is, you know, you know, our expression, they on my last nerve. That's the, the last one. They on my last nerve. They about to get it. I go back to a verse, my dad, it was, it was one of the key verses in his life, Ephesians 4.29. And here's a verse for us to, to keep in our hearts and commit to memory. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. 
but only that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto their hearts. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Corrupt uh, is a word that it means putrid, rotten, you know, stinking, filthy, unwholesome, ugly, harmful. Let no corrupt communication, and that word means speech, no corrupt speech, words, talk, sayings, don't let it come from your mouth. And let's make sure we understand. It says, let no, none, not any, not a single word. It doesn't say cut back on all of that. It doesn't say taper off on all of that. It doesn't say that. It says, let none proceed out of your mouth. Not one word, not one word. No unholy talk, no ugly words, no exceptions. And I go back to the question, why do so many Christians think this doesn't apply to us? That all of these verses we read and all the many others, you know there are dozens and dozens of verses that deal with this subject and we shrug our shoulders and go right on acting like these verses aren't even in the Bible. What kind of speech constitutes corrupt speech when he says, let no corrupt speech proceed out of your mouth? Well, it would include anything from filthy talk, profane talk, lies, false accusations, profanity, bitter words, angry words, cruel words, harsh words, divisive words, critical words, callous, unkind, proud, haughty, arrogant, in fact, you just about put anything in there. Deceitful words. Words that cut and bite and wound and injure and devour. My dad had a little three-by-five card. It said, it, it had Ephesians 4.29 written out on it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth except what's good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer, he had that over the telephone. Because, you know, back in those days, it was, you know, your phone was attached to the, to the wall. Well, he had that right over the telephone, and he had another one on the dashboard of his car. Three by five, <laughs> stuck right on the... But I'm going to tell you, he practiced, he practiced it. He certainly practiced it. And uh, he, was, he was a good role model with that because... He was pretty good at it. Nobody's perfect at it, but he was pretty good at it. There are things that can prod us and provoke us that make us want to just, uh, you know, explode. But here's what the Bible says. No corrupt communication is to proceed out of your mouth. None. And as we mentioned last week, polluted speech comes from a polluted well. Bitter words come from a bitter heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks an evil man. Out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things, Matthew 15. And a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. How can you being evil bring forth good things? Remember what the Lord said? A couple of years ago, uh, much to the dismay of Brother Gordon and others, Bluebell closed its factories. You know why? Because of a little bacteria called Listeria. Listeria closed the factories down. Isn't that something? Because people were eating Bluebell ice cream and getting sick. In fact, a number of people died. So it's pretty serious sickness. But here's the thing. They discovered that the disease, the sickness, came from the factory. The result was people ate it, and it killed them. Well, here's the factory right here. We have a factory in our own heart. 
that manufactures words. And they can be good or they can be evil. And they can do good or they can do harm. What's here, if there's poison here, venom here, anger and bitterness and resentment here, it comes out here. And it injures those who are on the other end of it. Y'all awake? The Lord also said in Matthew 15, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of the mouth. That's what defiles him. It's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth. Matthew 15, 11. So remember the Pharisees, the Jews were sticklers for what you eat. They went by kosher diets. But here's what the Lord said. Here's what the Lord said. It's not what you eat that defiles you. It's not what you eat that makes you unholy. It's not what you put in your mouth that contaminates you. That is spiritually. So go ahead and eat those frog legs. <laughs> eat the crawfish. Eat the ham sandwich. It's, that's not what defiles you. What defiles a man is what comes out of his mouth. Now here's what the Lord said. That's what defiles a man or a woman. That's what makes them unholy. Not what you eat, not what you put in. It's what comes out. I'm going to read this to you in a couple of other versions. The food that you put into your mouth doesn't make you unclean and unfit to worship God. The bad words that come out of your mouth are what make you unclean. Another one says, what goes into a person's mouth doesn't make, him, doesn't make him unclean. It's what comes out of the mouth that makes a person unclean. And another says, it's what comes out of the mouth that makes a man unholy. Jesus went on, Matthew 15, the following verses. He said, don't you understand that whatever goes into your mouth goes out into goes into the stomach and then is eliminated. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Jesus said evil thoughts are defiling. And while I would dare say that many of us would not think about things like murder, fornication, uh, stealing other people's things, that, that doesn't, probably for the most part, doesn't even enter into uh, your, a person's minds. But on the other hand, evil speaking is something we shrug our shoulders at and dismiss it as though it doesn't even exist as a prohibition. And the Bible says it defiles us. It makes us unholy. The problem is we take hurts and offenses or whatever it is, we replay it over and over and over again in our minds until it becomes a seething pot on the stove, you know, just until it starts boiling over. Once it starts boiling over, it's like it comes out of our mouth and becomes evil talk, accusations, slander, disputations, arguments, strife, insults, backbiting, bickering, animosity, and all the other things. Or as, e as Ephesians 4.29 calls it, evil communications, evil talk that comes out of our mouth. How about this one? Here's another great verse. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. Let your speech be always with grace. Not occasionally, not sometimes, not once in a while, not even most of the time. But let it always, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Now, the idea of this is savory, flavorful, 
the idea is it makes it taste good. A little salt for flavor. Let our speech be that way, that we may know how to answer or how to speak to every man. Our words should be gracious. Our words should be kind. Our words should be considerate. Our words should be living, uh, loving. Our words should be wise. Like the virtuous woman, Proverbs 31, verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Proverbs 31, verse 26, the virtuous woman praised by all, praised by the Lord, praised by her husband, praised by her children, praised by the neighbors, the community. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue, is the law of kindness. That should be in our tongue too, not just the virtuous woman, but the virtuous man. Lord, help us all to be like her. When she speaks, she is kind. When she speaks, she is gracious. When she speaks, she is wise in her choice of words wise in so many ways. May we be like her. Amen. The opposite of the virtuous woman, the venomous woman. When she speaks, ain't no kindness there. Venom, hurt, fight, critical, insult, belittle. And look, it's not just women who do it. The virtuous, there's virtuous women, virtuous men, virtuous and vengeful and vindictive and venomous men as well as women. How about this verse? Here's a great verse. Write this one down. Proverbs 12 and verse 18. Proverbs 12:18. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. Great verse. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. That, you know what a sword? It stabs, it injures, it harms, it kills. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. Careless words. Stab like a sword, but the words of wise people bring healing. That's how one version translates it. Another one says, some speak rashly like the cutting of a sword, but what the wise say promotes healing. And the English Revised says, speak without thinking and your words can cut like a knife. Be wise and your words can heal. That's what the Bible says. Your words can heal or your words can hurt. They can do great good. They can do great harm. Like a knife. Look at it this way. You're the doctor. The person standing before you that you're conversing with is the patient. With your words, you can heal or you can harm. You're the doctor. You write the prescription. What will you do? Well, they got on your last nerve, so they better run. Because I'm going to use my scalpel on them. You're the doctor. The person that you are conversing with is the patient. Physician, do no harm. Help us, Jesus. You know, sometimes the Lord will send people our way and they may be people who are hard to deal with. Maybe a family member, maybe a loved one, maybe a neighbor, a co-worker, whoever it may be. I believe the Lord allows these people in our lives for us to have a good effect on them and for them to have a good effect on us, a good effect, because it helps us to crucify our flesh. They act like sandpaper. They rub us the wrong way, but sometimes that's what it takes to smooth us out. 
They rub us the wrong way, and we have to overcome, crucify the flesh, and be kind, be gracious, be polite, be loving. Be kind, be gracious, be polite, be loving. You're the doctor. There's a passage in the book of Job I was looking at. We're about to begin a study in the book of Job on Wednesday nights. Uh, we won't. I have something else I'm going to bring this coming Wednesday, but I intend to start uh, the Wednesday after that. One of the really great books of the Bible deals with many, many, many profound questions. But in the book of Job, chapter 4, Eliphaz, one of Job's friends, said something to Job that really stood out in my mind, that I pray it'll be able to be said about each and every one of us. You know, Job went through his terrible trials. But this is what Eliphaz, his friend, told him. Job 4.4, 4, he said, Your words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. Now, Eliphaz said this about Job. He said, Your words helped those who were ready to fall. You gave strength to those who could not stand by themselves. Your word. Your words. That's how you did it, with your words. You helped them. You strengthened them. I like the way Moffat translates it. Listen to this. Your words have kept men on their feet. Your words have kept men on their feet. You kept them going by your encouragement. That's a great thing to be said about a person. That they were such an encouragement to me in a difficult time. That they stood with me. They prayed with me. They talked to me. They, they were such a strength to me. That's what Eliphaz said to Job. Job, your words helped so many people. May that be said about us. Remember, you're the physician. The patient is the one standing before you. The person you're conversing with. That's the patient. They need healing. They don't need more injury. Help us to be healers. Our words can help. Our words can heal. Or our words can harm. Our words can injure. We can, br we can bring greater separation, greater division. It's all right here. Last verse, James 1, verse 26. I didn't even go to James yet. I'm going to James next week. James 1, if any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue but deceives his own heart, that man's religion is vain. James 1, 26. That man's religion is vain, useless, worthless, futile. If any man among you seems to be religious, but does not bridle his tongue or her tongue, he deceives his own heart, and their religion is vain. Remember, our text today was 1 Peter 3.10, For he that will love life and see good days. Here's the recipe. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Father, we pray today. Lord, we see that there are so many admonitions, warnings, words of instruction regarding the use of our tongue. Help us to be wise. Help us, Lord Jesus, to get our mouths under control and not use our tongue to injure or to harm, but to heal. Forgive us, Lord, for all of our failures, for our shortcomings. Forgive us, Lord, for all the things we've allowed ourselves to say. Forgive us, Lord, for justifying it. Forgive us, Lord, for excusing it. Forgive us, Lord, for our neglect of all of these verses and so, so many more. Lord, help us to say as David did, 
but I will guard my tongue. Lord, and let us pray as David prayed. Set a watch, O Lord, upon our tongue, upon our lips, upon our mouth, that we sin not with our tongue. It's our prayer today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.